This episode is about minutes 56 through 60 of The Rise of Skywalker with returning guest, Tony Thaxton. Hello there, and welcome to Star Wars Music Minute, where we celebrate the music and sound of Star Wars five cinematic minutes at a time. I'm Chrysanthi Tan, but you can call me Xanthi, and today is all about minutes 56 through 60 of Star Wars Episode 9, The Rise of Skywalker. In this episode of the film, our heroes flee from Kijimi with the help of Zori's medallion, and they land in the hangar of the Steadfast. Rey uses some Jedi mind tricks on stormtroopers, they rescue Chewie from his cell, they get into a shootout with more stormtroopers, and then Rey wanders into Kylo's quarters, where she sees the mangled mask of Darth Vader and picks up Ochi's dagger, which gives her a vision of her parents. And then finally, we end with Rey and Kylo beginning to do one of their like force Skype sessions. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to have you back, Tony. Thanks for thank you. joining. Yeah, thank you for having me. Always, always a pleasure. And uh, get ready for me to sound like a dummy, like I feel like I always <laughs> you do. You never do. <laughs> <laughs> that never happens. Um, well, you're very kind. Yeah. Um, you have, I'm super jealous that you've just gotten to be like, doing like a full-on recording studio stuff. Um, we were just talking before starting that I've been like recording stuff at home, but I miss going to like a, an actual studio. And and Tony's just been doing that with, um, yeah. with his band, re- recording their first, or I guess releasing their first album in how many years? Uh, boy, uh, yeah. Th- so there was one Motion City soundtrack record that they made after I had left for a few years. And I think that one came out in 2015. Mm-hmm. So, so nine years, I guess. But then the last one I played on was in 2012. So, wow. yeah. How cool! It's really cool that yeah, you, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's exciting. Yeah, we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully people like it. But I, I think so. I uh, I really didn't know what really we were in for because it, it's it's a lot different these days. We're all spread out throughout the country, and we're not doing this full time anymore. So mm-hmm. like getting together to write is not necessarily the easiest thing. So, you know, uh, thankfully demoing and all that from home is easier these days, but I kind of showed up without even really hearing much. And, uh, I kind of just like that. I kind of like not being super prepared, if that makes any sense. Oh, interesting. Um, cause sometimes it's just like one, you're not overthinking it. And two, sometimes, sometimes those little like cool, accidents happen or like maybe you didn't mean to do something because you didn't know the song well enough yet but then you're like oh wait that was an accident but I actually really like that have you seen that okay we'll start the Rise of Skywalker's uh, minutes in just a second but now I need (laughs) to know have you have you seen that YouTube channel where they have like drummers listen to a song for the first time without the drums and then they add Mm -hmm. their own drums no I have not yeah it's it's it makes me think of this because they have like not really much time to prepare and they kind of just see what, see what happens, like what yeah. they're vibing with. And then they get to hear what the actual drums are in that, in that song. Uh-huh. And it's, yeah, someone did it, um, for like the killer song, I think Mr. Brightside probably. Um, uh-huh. and they had never heard, I don't know if this drummer had never actually heard that song and added completely different drums that went like half time in the like, in one spot. Oh, wow. It was, it was wild. Um, yeah, I, I would I would be curious about that. I'd like to see that, yeah. Yeah, I'll let you, I'll let you know the channel um, yeah, please do. later. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, let's start listening to these minutes. All right. Okay. Clear for entrance. Sorry, I don't know 12. why that skipped. Okay, let's try that again. We have to go now. Come with us. Oh. Can I kiss you? Go. It's very, that's a very loud 30 seconds of music and sound. <laughs> Lots happening. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll put on screen what's happening here. Let's see. Okay, so so the medallion. Zori's not going with Poe. And mm-hmm. then we have like the vast space. 
And then, oh no, we're not here yet. Okay. No. Wait. Am I in the wrong? Are these? Okay. Um, yeah. Do you have, I mean, we'll go through a little bit more um, detailed in a second, but do any like themes or like musical moments stand out to you? Um, you know, I think last time I did this, I talked about how a lot of times I, and I think of this as being a good thing. I don't necessarily notice the music a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, but I think that's kind of how it should be in a way. Um, but yeah, I do like, I think there's like kind of some hints of or playing with the Kylo Ren theme in, in there. Um, and yeah, that's really the main thing I notice. which, and I, I think... I think that's kind of what is good about the whole um, not noticing the music sometimes is because things like the Kylo Ren theme, I think the first time or two that I saw like The Force Awakens and heard that, like it didn't even like register as like, oh, this is like his music. And then, yeah, it took it took several viewings or the other movies to come out. And like, oh, okay, this is, this is his song here. So, uh, yeah, I just... I think I'm, I'm a little slow to start picking up on a lot of those things a lot of the time. Um, do you, are there any other like shows or movies that you watch sometimes where like the themes seem, the musical motifs or whatever seems so obvious that they become annoying or cheesy? Is that ever a problem with you? Um, yes, but like they're usually specific thing. Like, there, there's a show that I really like uh, that kind of drove me nuts because anytime I really liked the show, but anytime there was like a, a change of, of scenery, you know, and they like the old like classic thing of like a sitcom where like we're going back to the house. So here's a quick shot of the house from outside and here's some little music behind that as we cut to the next scene. And this show like used the exact same clip of music every single time. And like, so things like that, that's a little extreme. It's like, all right, play with it a little bit at least. Um, oh, yeah. 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 I but I, yeah, I like, like there's that kind of stuff. And then, um, I think it, the only other time it really like maybe gets that way for me is if it's not necessarily a score, but they're using pre existing songs. And, mm -hmm. you know, that works really well a lot of times, but sometimes. <laughs> Uh, sometimes I get a little too distracted by that because if it's a song I know or it's a song I really like especially then I'll find myself paying attention to that instead of what's happening in the show yeah I feel like have you seen Umbrella Academy I have not I'm okay, aware well, of it but I've not seen it yeah well there's a it's not the only show that does this by any stretch but the first few times they put in like you know source like a placed music from like, like popular music the first couple mm -hmm. times it's really fun and then you're like okay I bet they're gonna do another song here I bet they're gonna do another yeah. song here um yeah yeah the uh that show the bear is, mm. is oh, yeah, distracting totally. for me because they I feel like whoever picks the music for the show it's like they went into my CD collection back in the day because it's like every almost every song they use is like I love this song I love this song I love this song so yeah that one gets a little and they reuse a little, uh, like a few songs in that one like a lot like yeah use the same there's song, that main that what'd you say yeah like they'll use like that same I can't remember who if it's like is it a metallic the, um, uh, nope. the refused is the one that they that, that that's they, this guitar riff that they yeah, play yeah. a lot and it's like it's weird because it, I don't know if that song was used in like a remix of some other things or what because there's other little things happening here and there uh, but then eventually I remember because they were always doing I was like oh is this used in another song and then finally there was an episode later that the song actually kicks in with the vocal and I was like ah oh, there it is there it is <laughs> um, yeah so uh, just now starting these minutes all over again, but talking through it more. We have to go. So now. Kylo Ren's Come theme, aggressive. Oh, can I kiss you? Go. Oh. But it doesn't linger for very long. And I think that is another, that might be contributing to why the themes are kind of like slipping through, slipping through our fingers sometimes, mm -hmm. um, is John Williams doesn't necessarily like linger on them and, and belabor them all the time. Sometimes they're overlaid on other stuff. Sometimes they're woven in really, really slyly. And, and in this case, it's just a short thing. And then it moves on to some sappy music for, for Poe and Zori. 
Mm -hmm. and it just keeps it moving. Yeah. That's Kylo Ren's B theme. Uh. Hesitant. <laughs> and then we're on to... <laughs> and that little, like, riff that we get has been... I don't know. It's not listed in, like, Frank Lehman's complete catalog of the musical themes of Star Wars. I don't think if I have... If I've missed it, someone please point it out. So I'm just calling it like the fleeing from Kajimi thing. It's like. We get that um, like all over this track on the soundtrack. It's called fleeing from Kajimi. And then we get it even more later these minutes in a different track. Um, mm -hmm. It's like a strident uh, violin thing. And there's like timpani, I think, like keeping the pulse. Um, yeah, we just talked about the scene. Uh, I talked about this in the last set of minutes, so mm -hmm. listeners may remember. Um, <laughs> and then... So now we're in Ochi's ship. Medallion's good. Clear for entrance into Hangar 12. Hang on, Chewie. We're coming. Whoever this Chewie person is, this is madness. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I find it really kind kind of hard to hear the music, actually, in that clip. A little bit, yeah. It's pretty buried. Yeah. I am going to play from the soundtrack so we can get a better a better listen. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm playing from the actually the I'm playing from the four year consideration soundtrack, fleeing from Kajimi. I'll start. Right. I think that part is interesting because, I mean, I think it sounds like it's hinting at the Kylo Ren theme, but it's not doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. It, uh, <laughs> it's a, a, a very obvious statement, I think, but it's, it's just very Star Wars music. It's very Star Wars music. <laughs> <laughs> and like, uh, you know, uh, I feel like while you can maybe have like similarities between a lot of John Williams things here and there they still like manage to sound different enough i think uh, I, I think like when i hear star wars music i'm like that's star wars music mm -hmm. if I, even if i heard it out of context i think that would actually be a, a good experiment it would be a good experiment and i'm thinking about yeah. that now yeah but like i feel like i can tell star wars apart from superman and i feel like i can I can tell Star Wars apart from Harry Potter, but there are some times where the line is blurred for sure. Yeah, I remember that always being a thing when I was younger. I would always, I, I knew the Star Wars theme and I knew the Superman theme, but if I thought of one of them, I could not then think of the other one. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's gone away as I've gotten older, but yeah, that always used to be like, wait, which one is which? Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, that actually that that would be a good experiment. I would... Yeah, I just play like not not uh not like Leia's theme and not like really popular right. parts of the soundtracks, but just like of course. spots like this that mm -hmm. are probably not recognizable or at least overtly memorable. Um, yeah, yeah. So this is how do you feel about the uh, in now some of these shows like completely different styles of music being done by different people? What how are you feeling about that? Overall, I feel like it is a perfectly good experiment. I think the success of it has varied vastly from yeah. show to show. And I, I think sometimes the style 
like, I think the most obvious style changes are Mandalorian with uh, Ludovic Gornson. And that, that's a, the most obvious style change. And then Andor is also a significant style change, Nicholas Bertel. And mm-hmm. then I would say, I can't think of anything else that has enough of a style change that it feels like an intentional choice to do something different. Right. Um, and I think Andor was very successful for me um, because I felt like what was happening musically was really connected to what was happening in the show. Mm-hmm. Um, Mandalorian, I think the like the really catchy main main themes and stuff, I really like. I think they're mm-hmm. um, I don't know, like they're, they're hits, you know, clearly. Um, yeah. But I think a lot of the rest of the underscore, just the stuff that's, you know, like in moments like this where it's just not the main part, but is, is a little bit weak to me. Um, Mm -hmm. and then I think the, that the main titles are sometimes over relied upon. Like, it's like, I'm just waiting for my song to come back on and is how I feel sometimes. Um, yeah. yeah. What about you? I gotcha. Um, I think I would agree with most of that. It, it's, it always takes me a little getting used to, like I read that being like kind of one of the biggest things with Mandalorian the first time. It's like, what is, yeah, it was like, uh, even just, even just that like behind it, like even that was like, I was like, wow, this doesn't feel Star Wars to me. But like, it's, you know, it just took some time and now I'm used to it and I think it works. Yeah. How did you feel about um, like Rogue One and Solo A Star Wars Story? Um, they were mostly, you know, again, I'll give it that, like, I didn't really, it didn't stand out to me, but I don't even necessarily mean that in a bad way. Yeah. So it wasn't like, distracting it just kind of, then. Yeah. It just, it, they fit for me. There was nothing necessarily that stood out good or bad to me. And then what about like the Clone Wars or Rebels or, or the Acolyte or, you know, like any of the Kiner scores and then like right. the Acolyte? Um, man, I, I can't even remember Acolyte music. (laughs) Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I can't even remember what the deal on the music was for that show. (laughs) Um, and then, yeah, with Clone Wars, I, I've, I've watched them all, but I, it's, it's, I don't get as into the animated stuff. Um, it's usually like kind of throw it on in the background while I'm doing other things. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it's it, the main thing I remember about the Clone Wars music is because don't they have the uh, like version of the theme? But it's like a little more yeah. I don't want to like, say dancey did, did, or something, did, did, but it, like it, yeah, it's more punchy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's just more of a like actual like backbeat to it or something. Almost not not backbeat, but at least a pulse to it that's not really there otherwise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's like. More more rhythm happening. It's like da 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 da. da. Uh, right, yeah. right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um. Anyway, let's continue listening. Oh wait. All right. where, what was I listening? Where were we? Where were we? Oh, we were in the. Okay, we were on the soundtrack. We'll just keep this for a second. <laughs> Aggressive timpani use, <laughs> for sure. And now we're on to something pretty different. So I'm going to go back to the to the minute so we can get that back in context um, mm-hmm. and discover what the timpani was for. Uh, let's see. They've Bring landed. Happily. Which way? So that little bit of music that we just heard is actually a theme. It's like a variant on the friendship theme. Um, it's... I don't know if you... Did you catch it? No, I, I'm not... What's the friendship theme? <laughs> oh, yeah, no. Uh, valid question. I'm going to put... I'm going to put this up on screen for people who either can read sheet music or just read the the description in 
Frank Lehman's catalog of Star Wars themes. Let's see. Um, a long-breathed and songful representation of the bond between Ray, Finn, and Poe, specifically, and fellowship generally, perhaps the most sentimental of all Star Wars themes. And then it's um, basically... Etc. Um, mm -hmm. Does that ring a bell? No, I don't think it did. I think it's like one of, it's definitely one of my favorite bits of music from this film. Mm -hmm. um, and listeners may recall that we talked a lot more about it on episode nine, so about three episodes ago. Um, but what we're hearing now is, I'll, let, me get, let me get the variant on screen. Friendship variant. Let's see. Okay. And this is, it's a very, it's a very similar idea. Um, it's clearly based on this one, but it just, it goes. Instead of, sorry. So instead okay. of the first note going like, up and then down, it goes down and then up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, it's just like in there for just a very short bit, like a couple seconds, and then it's on to the next thing. So it's not, it, it's just really slipped in there. Right. Yeah. I'll go back. Play that again. Let's see. And then here. You three stay there. Happily. Which way? Uh, no idea. Follow me. The crescendo. I'm actually sad that you can't hear all the all the harps on that because if mm -hmm. we if we go to what it is on the soundtrack, it is. Let's see. Here we go. You can hear harps going like. <laughs> That just sounds fun to play. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> do you do you know how? This is something I've wondered about for a long time, but I've never actually looked into. When John Williams writes a score, do you know like his process, other than seeing the movie or whatever? But like, I assume he kind of does them on piano first, yeah. and then sort of. I just I feel like that world. As someone who's played music his whole life, like that side of music, I'm just like, I have no idea how one, if you're writing for a orchestra like that, like I just, I can't imagine having that many pieces mm -hmm. to figure out. Yeah, he typically sits at his piano and writes you know, by hand with pencil. Um, mm -hmm. And because of his vast experience so before he was like this composer, he did work like he was a session player in orchestras, mm -hmm. a piano player. And then he also got to help um, arrange things, orchestrate things. And so he really knows the different considerations. Um, you know, like when you pair this instrument with that instrument, what register to do it in so that mm -hmm. you, you can make sure that you hear both of them. Like he knows which things pair well together he has like a a very hands on um i don't know hands on experience and and taste um based on experience so he does um like a very i forgot how many lines how many staves his his, his sketches are kind of reduced they're not the full um what you hear 
in the movie, but that's because he has like shorthand um, where he'll, he'll write like maybe all the wins in one line or something. Um, mm-hmm. And then it'll be like clear what he wants. And this is actually unusual for a composer. A lot of composers will kind of write the sketch and then an orchestrator will assign the different parts to different instruments, but he generally pretty much knows like what instruments he wants to be doing what. And then so the next, he handles all of that himself. He, um, mostly like the ideas of it and puts mm-hmm. them in a um, like his sketch, and then someone else takes that in and, and interprets that, and then expands it out to actually have the the lines of music for each instrument. Um, right. The people who are credited as like the orchestrators, they'll often say that like for John Williams, they don't actually have to, they don't really have to do. <laughs> much other than copying what he's the instructions yeah. that he's given but there are still like certain decisions that an orchestrator um can make so at any given time i would guess that an or- orchestration decision would be mainly john williams's but there's always a chance that it could have been um like a, an editorial suggestion from an orchestrator as well um yeah but yeah some of the like wilder cues like the battle of hoth where there's like i forgot like how many grand like two grand pianos or just it may have been more than two grand pianos let me fact check that but um it's clearly john williams intentionally trying to do something right gotcha have you ever i know you do a lot of session work have you done any scores scores yes john williams scores no well no i i yeah yeah i figured that would have you know you'd start each episode by saying I played on a John Williams score, yeah. <laughs> as you should, if that was the case. Yeah, that, that, that would be uh, so cool. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, how do you like that process as opposed to, like, if you were just playing on a pop record or something? Well, it's very different, although there's dif- also a lots of versions of playing on a pop record too, because I've like played on a yeah. pop record where I'm part of an orchestra, and I've also played on a pop record where I'm maybe the only violinist, so I'm doing right. like lots of solo parts, and I've played in like a quartet or like a small ensemble. Sometimes it's improvised, sometimes there's sheet music. Um, mm-hmm. I generally, I find um, more creative freedom when it's a smaller um, ensemble, and if yeah. I'm if I have the ability to kind of help create create my part or something, um, I've done so. I've done a lot of films, but most of them have been um, up until recently. Most of them had been um, like either indie or shorts. Um, and mm-hmm. then I did one um, major motion picture this year, and it was um, what was it Beverly Hills Cop Axel F. Mm. and um, it was, I found it really fun actually, but it was not really what you would call like a creative endeavor. Um, right. it was like the main things that I get nervous about in those sessions are not like playing the music. It's more like, am I going to do something really silly to mess up the recording, like drop my bow, ruin a take or something. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Like the protocol of it is just like have to be dialed in. And then like another time it was, I forgot to put my mute on my violin. So I had to like go to my case and get my mute out. And that was pretty embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Well, but I find the pressure fun. I like the, I like recording under pressure. Yeah. It makes me concentrate better. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think so. And uh, if it makes you feel any better, I have shown up to a recording session uh, without drumsticks before. So. <laughs> no. <laughs> that felt that's real cool. Bad. Yeah, yeah that's pretty bad. <laughs> uh, yikes. <laughs> um, yeah, I once forgot my violin going to music camp and my <laughs> sleeping bag. So like the music part and the camp part. I just forgot to <laughs> Where did you think you were going? I don't know. Uh, um, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to keep playing. Me. Storm's 
stormtrooper marching. Drop your weapons. It's okay that we're here. It's okay that you're here. It's good. You're relieved that we're here. Thank goodness you're here. Welcome, guys. Does she do that to us? We're looking for a prisoner and his belongings. What do you think of the lack of music there? Uh, you know, it, it's funny. I, I think because we just listened to that without the picture and mm -hmm. uh, it definitely made me notice it more. I it like, I guess, you know, we are talking about music, so there's that. But like, I do think it, it, that does stand out to me more without the visual there that like, oh, this is, uh, yeah, there's, there's no music here, which... It's uh, it's pretty consistent throughout most Star Wars movies, right? Like, there's not a not a ton of m spots without music, really, is there? Or am I totally crazy? I mean, there are, but I feel like they're. Uh, I guess they feel like intentionally uh, placed moments, and like in a spot like yeah. this, I feel like it's pretty characteristic to not have music because it helps the the comedy of the scene play out better without like yeah. it, it's i feel like when the music is, when the score at least um cuts back it has the effect of placing me in more real time with what's uh -huh. on screen and whereas the music can help make um a scene move along faster for me or it can help me um hand wave and help me understand when there's like a time jump um, mm -hmm. or when events are compressed into a shorter time time period. I feel like music can help with that. But in a moment like like this Jedi mind trick, it is sort of like a moment where where I kind of like, you know, stop and hold my breath and just go like, uh, oh, one extra hitch, like hope we make it through. And then, and then yeah. it's so quick that, um, that I think it works. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a that's a good call. I see. See, these are the things I don't really think about. Uh, and I, I was thinking about how, if for some reason I were ever to score something like that, I think that would be like the biggest problem I would have is like second guessing everything, just going like, should there be music here? Should there not be music here? Like, <laughs> I think that would be my biggest issue. Luckily, you would have a director and stuff to help. Right. Help. Yeah. 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 Help you make those decisions. Um. Do you, how do you feel about the humor? Does that work for you? Uh, yeah, we're sure. I mean, I'm not like <laughs> laughing out loud or anything right, like right. that. But you know, it's like you know, give me a little like eh, in my head. But uh, yeah, it worked. And as and as you pointed out, I think yeah, the lack of music does help that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, another guest this season was kind of talking about how when there's especially when there's no music the rhythm of the dialogue, um, especially in this film, I think, like, or in Star Wars, really, is the dialogue stands out so much in a, in a way that's almost, like, musical itself. Like, it's, it's poetic. Not, not like this is poetic, but, like, the, the timing of it feels like it's, you know, like, there's a beat to it. Like, it's the timing of, the, of the, each, each of their lines feels pretty intentional. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the like rhythm, the pace of the dialogue stands out better when there's no music. Yeah. And I prob I think I probably chuckled in the theater the first time I saw this. Um, <laughs> yeah. And does she do, do that find... to us is sort of like a question that I'm surprised uh, no one in, I don't know if this is true, no one in Star Wars has outright questioned before. Because it is kind right. of sketchy when you see your friend able to do this. You're like, I hope she <laughs> yeah. doesn't do this to us. Yeah. Do you find yourself, you said you chuckled the first time you saw it. Do you find yourself a little overwhelmed the first time you see a new Star Wars movie? Uh, just because, like, it's uh, it's so much to take in usually. And, and I try, I personally try to go in with, like, I'll watch, like, any sort of official released trailer or TV spot or something. But other than that, I try to just avoid everything. So I try to go in not really knowing a whole lot. And uh, I find that, like... Even uh, like right afterward, like if a friend that I saw it with would be like, what'd you think? 
a lot of times I'm just like, I'm not sure yet. I got, I got, I need to see it again. I think to really, I, I usually need at least a second viewing to really know what I thought. Yeah, I get really overwhelmed when I see a new Star Wars film, and actually, I, I make it a point to do my first viewing alone because I don't want to mm. have to answer questions afterward and talk about it afterward. <laughs> I need time to like just sit with it yeah. by myself first before I'm ready to talk about it. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. But yes, completely. Yeah. Nice. I, I like the seeing it alone thing. That's, uh, I like that you're that. You're like, no, I can't even talk. So I think the talking about it is, is, helps me sometimes because I think I get so distracted by like every little thing. Like sometimes I'll just like notice a little alien in the background or something like, oh, what's that? And then I find myself getting caught up in that. And then oh, sometimes maybe after, after the movie, then a friend will like, mention something that happens I'm like wait I totally missed that I find that I don't remember little details like that at all unless yeah. like there's a reason that I've been thinking about like that category of alien already like right. I just feel like the whole thing washes over me like and then I sometimes get stressed about missing something like if I like if I didn't catch the names of all the planets and stuff mm. or, or what not yeah. But yeah, usually on that, my like second and third viewing, I just re- I realize just how much I missed the previous viewing. But mm-hmm. amazingly, I still feel like I walk out of a new Star Wars film feeling like I got it. But then when yeah. I go back, I'm like, oh, I didn't get this one part of the plot. But I still emotionally felt like I got it. And I think that's probably helped by the music, like mm-hmm. really guiding you. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't feel that way yeah. about every movie (laughs) (laughs) yeah about as in the music not helping with it or yeah and over I mean it's not only the music contributing and there's surely other fact other things but I I feel like sometimes I get to the end of especially a movie that has a lot of action and feel like I didn't really get it I get that like we won or whatever but I don't I'm like, did I miss a bigger point to this? And then sometimes the answer is probably, probably not, like with Rebel Moon. Mm-hmm. Like maybe it just, that was, that was it. That's just what it was. Um, but with Star Wars, I feel like, at least with the episodes, I feel like I, um, like I've never seen a Star Wars episode where I didn't walk away feeling um, actually pretty satisfied on a spiritual level by it Mm -hmm. um and so i think that's pretty cool (laughs) it's good for me yeah Yeah. absolutely yeah what about you i how did you take this film you know this has been an interesting one for me because i saw it and i really enjoyed it i remember seeing it the night it came out with some friends and uh, I remember thinking how quickly it felt like it moved along Uh, because I remember hearing how long it was ahead of time and then when it was over I was like wait that's that moved along that quick because it just felt like it was just kind of nonstop, just kept going and going which I liked Um, and I saw it a couple more times in the theater and enjoyed it uh, you know, there are moments I don't necessarily love, but uh, overall enjoyed it. But then a weird thing happened with this movie where I still enjoy it, but the I have just found... I don't know if this is just me getting older or what, but it is... Uh, I have found myself wanting to re-watch this one way less than I ever have with any of, their, of the movies. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not sure what, again, I don't know if that's just, I'm getting older and I don't do that as much anymore in general. Um, but like, yeah, normally when they then come out digitally or whatever, I will like immediately want to watch them and probably watch them too many times and kind of make myself a little bit sick of them. Uh, and I feel like this came out and I like watched it once and I was like, I don't know, maybe I don't like this as much as I thought I did. Um, but, uh. But yeah, overall, I enjoy it. There's there's things I don't love about it, but um, and at the end of the day, I always just say, I don't know. I just I just want to have fun at a Star Wars thing, and yeah. uh, I had a good time. So yeah, that's good. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I find myself rewatching all of the sequels less, but I think it's because they're more recent. And I think I yeah. still need time, need, need more space and, and time to think about them. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, plus it's kind of, it's easier to, to rewatch when, the, when I don't feel like the internet is so loud. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm going to continue. <laughs> the cameras. They said Chewie's this way. I like that little, like, riff. The... It's very, mm. it's very, like, uh, I don't know kind of jaunty but kind of like old it sounds kind of old school in a way um very winds and strings and kind mm-hmm. of like tiptoey yeah um, it's uh yeah it's a little s- sneaky and suspenseful yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Ray, come on the dark is on this ship we need it why? So that little bit of music, or whatever, is actually that is a theme, um, and we will we will hear it twice more in this set of minutes. I will okay. I will put this up on screen. It is um, it is Ochi's dagger, or sorry, it is Sith artifacts, parentheses dagger, um, and I'll read it to you. It is. An elusive leitmotif, most likely meant for Ochi's dagger, heard only on a handful of occasions in Tross, and not in the scene in which it features most prominently in Q5M10. Slightly onomatopoeic, both in intervallic profile, like a broken and jagged blade, and in emotional terms. More music of a persistent but unnameable sinking feeling. Um, that's such a good description of it. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um... And I'll play, I'll go back just a little bit so you can hear. It's this. Ray, come on. The dark is on this ship. We need it. Why? Here. Feeling. I'll meet you back at the hangar. Hey, Ray, you can't just. Chewie. Search the city again. And there we heard the. Um, we heard the fleeing from Kajimi theme, I guess. Search the city. Dee, 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 dee. Dee again. She's close. Of course we can't figure Chewie. <laughs> yeah, Ray's here. She's going to get the dagger. So here they rescue Chewie. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on the music here, on Chewy? Uh, well, for, I'm going to answer the Chewy part first. <laughs> uh, controversial opinion. I think it would have been, ac- even though we all love Chewy, I think it would have been better if they actually had had him die. I think because that was actually like a really like big moment when that ship explodes and you think like oh uh and 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 while i didn't want him to die obviously the the reveal later that like oh he's actually okay i remember actually weirdly kind of being (laughs) bummed is not quite the right word (laughs) but like go there yeah it was like oh it it felt like they yeah it just seemed like oh they yeah they didn't they didn't have the balls to do it did you feel that way about 3po as well his memory coming back um, no, not really. Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess I never thought about it too hard. I, uh, yeah, that just sort of happened for me. I didn't, I didn't really, uh, I guess I maybe just sort of thought that would be the case with him. I don't know. Mm. Um, but yeah. The, I, uh, felt, the chew- I feel like the, the, the trailer really teased 3 PO's death. So. Right. Oh yeah, because the taking a last look at my friends mm-hmm. line. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think that had me wondering, but I think also I've I've uh, 
caught on to uh, these trailers a little bit. I think sometimes how they they really try to fool you. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I think I just was like, I'm just going to wait, wait this one out and see what happens there. Yeah, fair. I also yeah. think it would have been stronger if Chewie died because that yeah. was such a big moment, like you said. And the thing is like, I'm guessing in theaters, I probably was like, oh my gosh, they actually did this. Yeah. I'm excited to see like how they resolve this, what kind of journey Ray has to go on to deal with this terrible thing that she did. And then I would, and then like, that sounds like a thing that they would need more than one movie to do. Right. But yeah, it would have been, I think it would have been cool to see Ray really have to struggle with staying on the light side while knowing that she did something really terrible, like having a real consequence to what mm-hmm. she did. Yeah. And I think it just would have been, a, a, while maybe not, not a surprise that a lot of people liked, uh, it would have been kind of a shocking thing that I feel like, I don't think these movies really had anything like that. I think they tried, but... Um, yeah, I don't think they were like too successful with giving us any sort of like huge like, oh my god moment. Yeah, um, I, I think mean, that could have been. I it. think Ben's death was kind of like actually. I mean, it felt final. It felt uh-huh. like surprising, I guess. But uh, not- are you talking his actual like the end of the movie death, yeah. or when we think he's dead earlier? Oh no. The- Oh, good point. Good point. The the end of the movie. The end of the movie. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. that was the that was I guess that was the other moment for me too is when we think that Ray killed him kills before him. she heals him. Uh, yeah, I was. No, that also would have been cool if she just killed him. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was. I was like, wow, they really. They're did going this, there. But yeah. <laughs> Three times. So yeah, there's two. I didn't even really think about. It. There's two of those kind of moments in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, Chewy in the cell. I feel like he looks like like his hair looks kind of slicked. Like his hair looks kind of slicked. He looks kind of <laughs> tired. I feel yeah. like he looks like he's just um, had a really rough night at the club or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, like, and it looks like he kind of is wearing eyeliner. Like he's just like, <laughs> here we go. Here's a good one. <laughs> Just like, <laughs> get me out of here. <laughs> I'm sorry I ended up in jail. <laughs> um, and then musically, I feel like this part sounds like E.T. Let me go back. Of course we can. Here. Chewy. <laughs> yeah, Ray's here. She's going to get the dagger. Okay, tell me how you feel about this. I'll, I'll, I'll play it on the piano. <laughs> But, Mm -hmm. um, okay. So first it's like... It's like... So just imagine those chords. It's so... Mm -hmm. I, I feel like that's... I feel like that's an ET moment. I, I, I didn't yeah, pinpoint I, exactly which like track it is on, but it's like, and then then it then it's like, dee, dee, dee. oh okay, so it's like on the you know on, on the main. Does it register like that to you, or am I just? Uh, I don't think I would have thought it on my own, but once you said it, I, I feel like I do hear it a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to just plug my conspiracy theories. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, that, that's a that's one of the like a John Williams like this score doesn't sound like the ET score, but there are certainly parts of it where it's like, oh, that reminds me of the thing from ET. That reminds me of the thing from Indiana Jones. That reminds me of the thing from Jurassic yeah, Park. Um, so for sure, always be those in a Williams score. That was yeah. I, I will say that was, uh, and I I don't remember if it was used in previous ones or not because again, a lot of times I just don't pick up on these things, but. Uh, in the then the new Indiana Jones that came out last year, I noticed uh, there seemed to be a, a theme for Marion in that 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 is very reminiscent of the Leia theme to me. Yes, like it was 
it was almost too similar. If I'm remember, it's been a while since I've seen it, so maybe I'd hear it again and and disagree with myself. But I just remember in the theater thinking like, "Oh, this sounds." But then also at the same time, I don't think John Williams did the music for the new Indiana Jones. He did. He did. Oh, did he? Okay. Yeah. For some reason, I didn't think he did. Never mind. But, I take it back. Maybe. Oh, you know, I'm thinking of Steven Spielberg because he didn't direct the new one. Oh, That's what okay. I was okay. Thinking of yes. Um. Yeah. Well, Marion's theme shares a lot of similarities with Leia's theme. And actually there's like, they, they both start with the major sixth, right? The. Mm-hmm. And I actually get it mixed up. That's also Hera's theme in Clone Wars or in Rebels Bad Batch. Um, uh-huh. And then. And then even Han and Leia's theme. Starts with the major right. six, and so it's kind of a. I, I've talked about this with a different guest, but there's, there are certain feminine romantic cliches in, in some of these scores for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and Marion's, and even and uh, Kira's theme, I believe in in Solo, also starts with a major six, I believe. Yeah. yeah. So definitely, there's definitely a a through line there. There's right. definitely a common influence happening there. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that Marion theme did exist before I could, I literally couldn't remember it. Hearing Marion's it theme did exist before. Yeah. There was a new it's theme. Weird there was Helena's theme was new though. Is that maybe what? Uh, I don't know. I think I just, I, I don't know. I think I just somehow had never really like put it together and it just clicked Fair. when I saw the <laughs> new one. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Um, okay, I'll keep playing. Whose ship is this? Ship's this way. Follow me. Over here! This little thing is the tension theme, mm-hmm. um, which is, I feel like, of all the themes in this set of minutes, this is the most understandable to miss because it does just kind of sound like typical kind of underscore. Um, but it, it, this specific kind of underscore is in the sequels, like all over the sequels. I, I, and I think I know what you're referring to. And it's funny because you said this is the easy one to miss. I think this is the one I picked up on. <laughs> That's um, really funny. Because this is sort of uh, the theme you're referring to is that if I'm remembering right, I think in The Force Awakens, like when, when we're seeing all the X-Wing pilots getting into the X-Wings and all that. Is it used there? I think so. I don't remember it's like, exactly. It's like It has that moment everywhere. that like... Bum, bum, bum. Oh, oh, oh. See, I think you're thinking of March of the Resistance, which is also very... It, it, they often happen like side by side. But, okay. um, but yeah, the March of the Resistance, I think it's going to be in these minutes too, if I recall. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it is, and it and it will be soon. So you're on the right track. We'll All right. we'll get to it in, a, in like 15 seconds. Wrong way. It's not really a right way, is there? So the music is just like light and bouncy and tense and out of the way here. That little woodwind flurry. Mm-hmm. Um, little woodwind filigree, as Tim Rodier from Omni Music Publishing calls it. It's like when, <laughs> when the woodwinds are, when any instrument, I guess, just does like kind of uh, an unnecessary, kind of just a flourish. It just seems to uh-huh. come out of, yeah, out of nowhere. And there's so many of those in Star Wars and they're, they're very delightful, I think. Oh, so is, there's not even like a visual thing that goes to that moment right there? There might be. I don't actually, that's a good question. Um, I suppose, let's see. I'm going to... I'm going to play this while watching. Okay. Why? Ray, you can't just... She's close. <laughs> Sorry, listeners. <laughs> I'm skipping forward. Okay, here we go. Okay, General Pride is walking into the drawn room. Whose ship is this? Ships this way. Follow me. Okay. The corridors. Not really a right way, is there? (laughs) 
They're just running. Oh, okay, okay. It's when Poe slides the, the blaster out of the way, the gun. Ah, okay. So as it's sliding on the floor, it's like... <laughs> that yes. makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because, yeah, again, hearing it without the picture, I just assumed something happened there. But yeah, no, that's, that's a, remember. a fair assumption. <laughs> and yeah, that yeah, that makes that little slide better for me now. Yeah, there you go. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. There's March of the Resistance. Yeah, you got that? <laughs> and then we're gonna get it a couple more times. This time in a different key. And then again. So like this modulation happens, it, it happens so quickly, so deftly. It's one of the things that's like John Williams is so good at. First it's an E flat minor. And then there's some other stuff that happens. And then next thing you know, we're in C sharp minor. And then G minor. Yeah, so... Very nimble, nimble and forward flowing, mm -hmm. almost like they're extemporaneous um, modulations, just that flow out of the rest of the action sequence. Um, yeah, Let's go back. Not that far back. It just seems to keep going. So Poe's been struck. Mm -hmm. oh. Oh. You okay? There's some dramatic music, some tragic no. music. You there, Drop your weapons now. And then get ready for some timpani. Hey, fellas. Shut up, scum. Chewie's laugh there. I know. What, why did, I noticed the subtitle says Chewie laughs. Why does it say he laughs? It's the weird. It's such. It's actually. A, it's quite a weird sound. It sounds like the whirring of a, of a droid or something. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, what do you think? Do you think it's a, not a laugh? Like, a, maybe it's a nervous laugh. Yeah, I thought it would like. I guess yeah, I could maybe see that. Uh, yeah, I just kind of took it as like a a uh, like scared sound. Yeah, <laughs> that's certainly not a laugh that I've heard Chewbacca do before. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah, it's unlike anything we've heard him do. And I remember that yeah. kind of getting like a big laugh in the theater at the time. Oh, really? And yeah, and I remember kind of thinking like, yeah, that was that was weird. But yeah, I always just sort of took it as like a scared or nervous kind of sound. Which, yeah. have we really heard him be scared or nervous? Uh, I think we've heard him. We've seen it in his body language, for sure. Yeah. I feel yeah, like I he has like done, like, sort of panicked, no, like, panicked groans and stuff. I think I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're, but like, you know, is... like, but they're, like, more, like, vicious sounding, whereas this one just sounds... A little like pathetic, almost. Yeah, yeah. It's like his nervous system is doing something that he can't control. It's just coming out <laughs> really strange. <laughs> um, yeah, let's hear that again. Hey, fellas. Shut up, scum. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> um, and then there's no more. There's no music for a bit. I mean, at least it cuts out or is very quiet. As Ray yeah. is entering Kylo Ren's very pristine, white-looking <laughs> living quarters. Um, very interesting-looking place to live. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, and I always say, the only thing, only thing you gotta... You need something to look Star Wars-y, just put those, like, oval lights on yeah. the, the, it's like that's all you gotta do is like oh this is Star Wars okay yeah not little, that the rest doesn't look like it too but I feel like that seals the deal that's so true those like 
Yeah, and lots of like panels, just with oh, yeah. just draw in various buttons. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> I kind of want to do this as a challenge now to just not look at any reference images, but just try to draw a place that looks Star Warsy. Yeah, decor wise. Yeah, lots mm-hmm. of little panels with lots of little buttons. Fun things to press, yeah. places to stick your yep. hand in, things mm-hmm. sticking up. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, some maybe some like occasional antenna kind of things here and there. Oh yeah, you gotta have the antenna. It. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then she sees this sh- this pedestal, this this stool that <laughs> <laughs> has Darth Vader's helmet on it. Which you'd think he'd at least have some glass around it or something, right? Yeah, it's like right there. But may- maybe if there's glass, he can't connect with it as as mm. quickly. I feel like yeah. touching things is, or at least I don't know. He, maybe he but wants he, more face think- to face. He does, like, actually connect with this, you think? I do think. I think he tries to. I think he meditates looking at it and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen, I, guess I, I guess I never really thought about it that way. I just always sort of saw it as him just sort of... Being proud speaking, to have it, so... Yeah, like display. speaking to it, but, like, not... Speaking to it, but not literally speaking to it, even though he is. I know that didn't make any sense, but <laughs> it made sense in my head. <laughs> I think if they put glass around it, it would be harder to shoot. It'd be probably hard True. to get it to not reflect or something. True. I know. I'm not supposed to think about things like that, but as a nerd who likes to collect things, be like, man, you got to put that in some glass or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when we see the ma- or when she connects with it, when she sees it, we hear in about five seconds. So, of course, that's the Imperial March. Mm -hmm. But it's like overlaid on top of the the beginning of the Sith artifacts dagger motif. Um, And I think that's a really cool uh, blending of those two two themes. It's very subtle. Um, Mm -hmm. Another place that we can hear... We'll hear it again in a second. But um, another place that you can clearly hear that motif is at let's see right here this is like 20 minutes ago this is when they're in the in the cave in the in the lair of the of the serpent perhaps i can transfer so when she first um looks at the dagger picks up the dagger i guess 20 minutes ago 30 minutes ago something like that uh-huh. So we're getting this again. We're getting close to the other thing, the other artifact that Kylo Ren has. Mm-hmm. So she sees the dagger. And now we hear that again. And kind of the same thing is happening. Another flashback. Mm-hmm. Right. And then Kylo spots her. I want to talk about the what Kylo Ren's like. <laughs> well, first, here's the mangled mask. We just have to put that on screen. The helmet. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Looking, you know, we get different angles of it. I think this one's a funny angle. It's the profile view yeah. of, the, of the helmet. You can see um, through it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It looks, it looks kind of like a few, like a few various aliens we've seen in Star Wars. If you, like, with the with the square jaw that like juts out like that. Yeah. And then Kylo's little, I don't know. This looks like his little gamer setup or something right here. Uh-huh. His glowing PC, um, <laughs> yes. just like in a, in a case. And it looks like one of those old, uh, like. Uh, I don't even know what they were called, but that like cylindrical thing on top of it, it looks like those things that used to have at the bank drive throughs, the automatic, or oh, not yeah. the automatic thing. The things, pneumatic. You know what I'm talking thing? about? Yes, there you go. That's yeah. what I'm looking for. Yeah. <laughs> That's really funny. And then 
again, like the dagger's just hanging out right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's, Put your, yeah. Uh, hide your stuff better. Come on. Yeah, well, though he does, <laughs> he is setting a trap for, like he does want her to, I yeah, think, you know. true. But yeah, still, right. like, that's, there's like a little um, indentation on, on the desk, on the platform or whatever, where it looks mm-hmm. like you should put something where that circle is. Right. So yeah. <laughs> it's designed to display something right there. Mm-hmm. And it ain't that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so she picks it up, starts hearing visions, or starts getting the vision of her mother, of her parents, and then Kylo. Wherever you are, you are hard to find. So Kylo's on Kajimi. I pushed you in the desert because I needed to see it. I needed you to see it. Who you are. I know the rest of your story. Right? Okay. That is the end of the minutes. But do you feel like when you were watching this movie for the first time, or maybe maybe it'd be more relevant in, in The Last Jedi, did you, were you ray lowing at all? Did you sense a sort of like, I don't know, sexual tension between them or, or anything like that? Like, is he being, there's like a many, multiple ways to read his lines here. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure if they were going to go there or not. Um, yeah, I really, I... I, I wasn't sure. Um, yeah, it is. So yeah, it, that's kind of a non-answer, but it, it crossed my mind, but I, I wasn't uh, positive if it was going to go that way or not. Yeah. And, uh, I don't even know still, years later, how I feel about it. Mm. Uh, <laughs> the, the you know, like the, the kiss at the end and all that. Um, I, I don't hate it, but I didn't love that it happened either. Mm-hmm. Fair. Yeah. I felt like The Last Jedi was really ramping it up a lot. And I feel like this movie didn't ramp it up as much, but it yeah. did have the, you know, the quote unquote payoff at the end. Mm-hmm. But um, The Last Jedi already kind of laid the groundwork groundwork for this. And yeah. this in this movie took a lot of that groundwork away from a few things. Yeah. Like what do you perceive as groundwork that was taken away? Uh, I, I took that, uh, it almost seemed like, I almost got the impression that there's almost like a, I don't know if rivalry is quite the right word, but I got the impression that J.J. Abrams was not a fan of The Last Jedi. And Hmm. I don't know if Ryan Johnson was necessarily a fan of what J.J. had done. Um, I'm only guessing all this, by the way. Uh, Mm -hmm. but just, there is that line, uh, that Luke said when force ghost Luke appears and, and he like catches her lightsaber and Mm -hmm. he says something about, I forget the line exactly. It's like a Jedi, whatever. You have to respect your weapon, (laughs) whatever the line is. Yeah. And, and like, I kind of took that as a shot at the last Jedi. Hmm. I could very well be wrong, but that's uh, literally even like when I saw it in the theater the first time, I kind of was like, really? "Ooh, that feels like a like a dig." Oh, really? I didn't yeah. take it as a dig at all. I talked. I took it as like Luke's almost making fun of himself because he's gone through this questioning period too recently. Yeah, and he's sort of yeah. like I took it as that he learned from it and is now trying to practice. Now is just um, like that. Luke has gone through his arc. Yeah, I mean, and and you can definitely use that I think I think maybe it's a little bit it's a little bit of both that's that's my that's your theory that yeah that's my conspiracy theory (laughs) noted um Um, the oh no please continue oh no I, I I was like wait what did you actually ask oh about uh groundwork yeah I think it was mostly the kind of the Yeah, I I just don't know that it. I I guess I don't have super specific things. It just kind of felt like the Last Jedi took it this one direction, and then this movie just went completely the other direction. Mm, like it wasn't what you were expecting or hoping in the narrative. 
Yeah, I think so. But also at the same time, I didn't. I don't know. I have complicated feelings on the about last the Jedi. Last... Yeah, uh, I have complicated feelings about both of, both of them, honestly. Uh, yeah. But um, I. Uh, I don't know. I think <laughs> I'm just rambling now. I say, I say, I say, go with what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just going to say that, like the the sound design in the, these Kylo Ray Force chats is really interesting. Um, Dave Accord and Matt Wood did an interview with the Dolby Institute, where the Dolby Institute, I think, interviews the sound designers who are nominated for Oscars. So, like mm-hmm. in in the interview that they did about the Rise of Skywalker, they said that. Um, like the ambiance during the those force chats is um, it's kind of shared and then they become one thing. That's a direct quote from the interview and I'm not exactly sure what it means. But then he says, then uh, Dave Accord says that the sounds within that connect space are different. So the sword fight, all the sound effects of the lightsabers, the swishes and the clashes and all those moments are not traditional saber sounds. They're all unique sounds to that weird space. And that's the thing they came up with um, with JJ, they were creating and using different sounds all together. And then, of course, from the mixing standpoint, there's like layers and layers of reverb, reverbs. Um, mm-hmm. Matt Wood says, and we would cut dialogue lines to pre-delay, like pre-verb into each. And then Dave Accord says, we were playing around with the dialogue, playing around even with Foley footsteps. But the main point is that like everything in that force connect space is completely unique and different to real space. And it's supposed to um, really take you out and in both of those moments, there's always that hard snapback to reality. You immediately kind of realize that you were just someplace else. Um, mm-hmm. And though that's kind of a, I'm, I'm actually curious if they changed their um, protocol or their approach at all from The Last Jedi because The Last Jedi had those Force Connect moments too. Um, right. They sound similar enough to be recognizable as the same thing. But yeah. I, I, I would, I would believe it if, if. There are slightly different things to them too. There, mm-hmm. Ren Kleiss was on The Last Jedi, and he's not on The Rise of Skywalker, so that's one person different in the personnel. But you know, Dave Wood, uh, sorry, Matt Wood and Dave Accord are pretty. They work on. I think they worked on both. They work on a ton of stuff together. Yeah. But I think I'll just play the end of this again so we can hear the the Skype chat. Mm-hmm. Actually, I'll go. Wherever you are. You are hard to find. You're hard to get rid of. I pushed you in the desert because I needed to see it. I needed you to see it. Who you are. So much reverb. I know the rest of your story. Right? Yeah. I feel like even without looking at the screen... Like watching the the movie, I yeah. feel like the sound kind of clues you in that like something different is happening here. Yeah, for sure. No, it's cool. I feel like that kind of stuff would be it would be really fun to just play around with that stuff and be able to come up with those types of things. Uh, although I feel like I would be terrible at it because I would never be able to because it just feels like the possibilities are endless these days. It's like, oh, what if I try this? What if I try this? And I would not be able to decide. Um, mm-hmm. What I was gonna yeah. say though was with what. Uh, you're talking about them, the, the stuff that they did for that. That actually makes me glad to hear because I do feel like one complaint with the newer movies that I've had and the shows is I feel like they're, they've gotten a little bit lazy at times, I think, with some of the sound effects. Hmm. I Like, particularly like droids. Uh, it's like, I, I just feel like I have started to notice using like exact sound effects over, and obviously in some cases that makes sense if it's a certain type of ship or something, but like literally like specific like BB-8 lines or R2-D2, like I've like noticed I'm like, oh, that's the exact little thing from that movie or whatever. Oh, interesting. Um, And I've just been starting to notice a lot of that with the newer Disney stuff. And uh, because even like... yeah, I, I wish I could think of a specific example, but I know there's been a few times where I've I've noticed that uh, stuff was just completely reused. It's 
I I feel like I don't notice those things as much. I, I, don't, I, I, I feel like you probably notice those things more than me. Like you're saying like exact dialogue lines from like droids. They're trying to pass off yeah. as like a new thing. Like yes. reuse the actual, like thinking no one's going to notice these same beeps or, or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Oh, and really I mean, sure, I guess you could make the argument of like, well, he happened to say the same thing that he said in that movie or something. But I don't know. The, the uh, yeah, the nerd in me that grew up watching those movies a million times and then I hear a specific beeping pattern and I'm like, I know that one. That's yeah. uh, But then yeah. a BB-8 one, you, you would just be, it would just be from The Force Awakens on, you mean? Yes, I I I, I said BB-8, but I I, I can't you remember if there's a specific it. example or not. But um, yeah, mm, I, okay. I started this. I started this out with a. I should have had a, a good example in mind, but I swear <laughs> okay. they're out there. Keep Let's yours. Hear, out. Please, uh, yeah. Um, I'm sure someone out there has made a video supercutting yeah. a few of these things. I would like to see it if someone is aware of the existence <laughs> of that or wants to make that. Um, yeah. I can't confirm or deny because I just don't, I don't know. I, I, it's a big question mark. Yeah. I would have to look at the, look at the evidence. Um, yeah, I just be, I may be just making bold claims. I don't know. <laughs> um, it is interesting though, like, cause back in the day with a lot of the sounds that they had, Ben Burt would have maybe like uh, in TIE, the TIE fighters or whatever, like there were a finite amount of TIE fighter sounds. Mm. And so in the new, like in the sequels, they, in the same interview, they kind of talked about having to create a bunch of new TIE fighter sounds because they can't reuse the same like 12 TIE fighter sounds from mm. the original trilogy. But they were kind of creating new ones using the same formula, basically like the elephant, uh-huh. the tire, like, but just different elephants and like, you know, different, right. you know. Um, but well, maybe my, maybe, maybe I'm just, they, they recreated them too well and I'm, I'm being fooled. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know. There, I wonder if there's also an element of trying to be faithful to the mm-hmm. original ways. So sometimes maybe creating a maybe a replica that is too on the nose. Maybe I don't know. This is yeah. speculation, of course. Yeah, but. and I mean you know it should it should be faithful to the old. It's just yeah. Sometimes I just I think there's just been some exact recycling at times. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. all. Fair. I believe you to an extent. <laughs> no. I believe you with uh, an asterisk to. Uh, that's look fair. into it more. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have anything else about these minutes or about the music or sound in this in this film that you didn't get to talk about? Uh, no, not necessarily. Uh, I, I, uh, yeah, like I said, complicated feelings on this movie. I like a lot of it. I don't like parts of it. Um, but yeah. And what are your thoughts on the John Williams cameo? I really, I, I like it. Um, yeah, uh, it was cool that they they got him in there for for the mm-hmm. last one, and uh, I like the the thing they did for the set too with yeah. little props uh, from his, all, his Oscar old nominated movies. movies. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think that's really cool. Yeah, I would love to actually. I would love to see all of the props in there, like cataloged with like what movie it goes to. Yeah, there's no, I, there's no books or anything out there that have shown this. I actually. Don't know. Um, the documentary on the Rise of Skywalker making shows yeah. like a few of them. It shows like Hook, mm-hmm. Jaws, but not certainly not even close to all of them. I don't know. Does a book like this exist? Listeners, please let me know if so. I just yeah, want... Was there... Is there one of those... Did they... Those making of books or whatever, did they do that for this I movie? Know. I can't remember. I usually eat those books up, but I... Uh, yeah. Again, this one I just... I didn't get as much of the stuff as I normally do. Yeah, I I feel like I would have known if there if all of the John Williams items were cataloged somewhere in a book. But maybe yeah. not. I don't know. Yeah. Someone I make say, this, yeah, please. If, yeah, av- absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, the musical themes in these minutes are Kylo Ren A, Aggressive, uh, The Friendship Variant, Sith Artifacts, Dagger, uh, Kylo Ren B, Hesitant, the tension theme, uh, March of the Resistance, and the Imperial March. And then in the soundtrack, you can find the music from this in Fleeing from Kajimi and the four-year consideration track, Hallway Shooting. Um, 
before ending, I have to ask you the Star Wars Music Minute questionnaire over again. Are you ready, Tony? <laughs> yes, I think so. Okay. This is your second time answering. Do you want me to give I you know. your old answer first, or do you want, do you want me to give it uh, just after? Sure. Yeah, I actually was trying to remember what I would have said before, and I don't remember. So do you want to know it first? Yeah, tell me okay. first. All right. So question number one is, in exactly three words, what does Star Wars sound like? You said previously, excitement, celebration, fun. <laughs> okay. that's That sounds like the boring answer I would give, yes. Because, <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, so I was like, something like that before. And then I was like, or wait, are we supposed to like do impressions of sounds or what? <laughs> uh, but I... Uh, I'm going to say, this isn't really answering it, I don't think, but this is what I'm going with. Okay. Ben Burt rules. Nice. <laughs> it's a good one. Yeah, because it's true. Tell me it I'm wrong. True. Oh, it's, <laughs> I think, it's absolutely true. I think true. the stuff that he did is is so cool. You take that stuff away and we got very different movies. Yeah, Ben Burt is crucial to this, to this yes. Star Wars sound world. Uh, yes. Question number two is, what is something related to Star Wars music or sound that you want to learn more about? And previously, you said Ben Burt and how all those sounds were made. <laughs> <laughs> On brand. Yeah, there's the theme here. Yeah, uh, yeah, I would, it, any any of that. I don't, I don't know why there's not, like, a documentary about him. Or maybe there is, and I'm not aware <laughs> I'm of it. Sure, but I there, feel like there are. <laughs> but maybe they're not, like, or, official, like... Yeah, know, that's like, what I want. I want a real one, like a, like a... Uh, like I wish they would have uh, had him on the Light and Magic show, or I feel like he was right. not even really on it. I don't think, but I would have liked to have seen a lot more of that of on him. Um, but like, yeah, that, and I know too. He did a lot of the like, even coming up with the like languages and stuff like that. Is seems like such a crazy process to do that, and then, uh, um, yeah, I think the the. One sound effect that I've always wondered about, because it just sounds so different than everything else to me, is the uh, the seismic charges. Mm -hmm. from, uh, yeah, that that that's just such a different sound. I've ever been really thrown by that the first time we hear one. Uh, um, so yeah, I've just kind of always wondered what that was. Yeah. Do you have any other favorite sounds of his? Ah, uh, boy. I mean, they're all, they're all cool. I like, know. I, I think it's um, the, I mean, the tie, the tie fighter sound is always stood out to me, and then uh, one I always will take note of is the uh, the speeder bike sound. Mm. That kind yeah, of that's really good. kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, and the different what about speeders you? too. Ooh, gosh. Favorite Ben Burt sound design. Um, I feel like this is kind of a, a okay. These are gonna be the most boring answers: lightsaber and R two D two. But hear me out. Like uh, creating like some sort of a, a sword or a weapon could, uh, like, how do you do that in a new way that is so yeah. specific and and iconic, but also like looks like it makes sense with visually what you're seeing. Like I think just mm -hmm. the whole creation of lightsabers in, in general with the sound that they make are, I think they just, I think they just nailed it with, with yeah. that. Um, and then R2 is like, we've heard lots of robots in films and they sound cool, but R2 sounds so alive. Um, yeah. And I feel like that set a new standard for like, how a robot could sound in in a sci-fi film or like in in a film in general. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I'll go with those for now. Yeah, I, I you can't argue those answers. Yeah. And then the other one that I give is also I just like the sound that doors make when they open and close, like especially mm. the, the yeah you know the ones yeah, and, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I got you yeah very good <laughs> A plus. <laughs> Um, the final question is, what is a score or soundtrack that you're fond of besides anything Star Wars? You previously said Pee-wee's Big Adventure, composed by Danny Elfman. I, I, that's funny because I, I think, yeah, the main other composer that I've ever really, like, took note of has been 
Danny Elfman. Um, Because this time I was thinking of uh, the other one that it may be like the only score soundtrack I ever bought when I was a kid was the uh, the 1989 Batman that Danny Elfman did. Nice. Um, I love that. The only and I, I do think Danny Elfman writes good scores, but I do think they get a little samey. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Yeah, because everything is boom, 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 yeah. boom, <laughs> and <laughs> which is fun and it works. Yeah. But like, yeah, it's it's a lot of times it's like uh, you don't even have to see his name. Uh, yeah, you're before just like, you this know. is Elfman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I feel you on that because, like, I also love a lot of Danny Elfman's score work. I mean, Nightmare Before Christmas is a favorite. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, there is, there is like, a – there is an Elfman th- – there yeah, there is a – I don't know if it's, like, a – I won't say it's, like, a flanderization, but, like, there is a way that Elfman just does Elfman sometimes in a, yeah. way, in a, way, in a way that Tim Burton does Tim Burton. Right. Yeah. But Pee Wee's Big Adventure is is solid. I remember I listened to that after you recommended that after you mentioned that on the, your last podcast. Uh-huh. So, um, yeah, and Batman nice. nineteen eighty nine yeah. is a good one as well. Yeah. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tony, thank you for coming uh, on the show and talking to me. Yeah, thanks for having me, and uh, thanks for putting up with my my drummer lack of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> music theory. <laughs> Wait, do drums not stand out? Do like drums and percussion not stand out to you in in Star Wars ever? Or uh, um, not too much. Like really, when you said that, literally the first thing that came to mind is like the um. I feel like there's two two moments that come to mind, and is uh the uh right as the Death Star. Right before it gets blown up or whatever, and there's oh, the yeah. big like timpani moment, boom, 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 mm-hmm. boom, that thing, and then the uh, when we see the uh, Tuscan Raider get on the <gasps> Bantha, mm. those are like the two I can think of off the top of my head. That, really stand yeah. out percussion moments. Yeah, yeah, because I feel yeah I feel like it's, they're generally not too percussion heavy overall. Mm. Yeah, and the moments where they are like overtly percussive I guess like the Tuscan Raiders thing for sure I'm actually okay if you if you go back and rewatch the Acolyte there are lots of like really percussion heavy fight sequences Phil is there yeah I, I, to I listen I, for <laughs> yeah it's uh, yeah it's like, like it's got that too recent of a thing for me right now or yeah, I think no, I, totally I only watched it one time through and uh and I just saw that it's apparently not coming back yeah I just saw that yesterday yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, well, anyway, um, where can people find you and your your work online these days? Uh, I've really been kind of quiet lately, but I am still on Instagram at Tony Thaxton. Um, Motion City Soundtrack is doing things sometimes here and there. Uh, yeah, the <laughs> new single called Stop Talking is out now. Um, there might be a record coming, but I have no idea when. Um <laughs> And yeah, I also play in a band called Don't Stop or We'll Die. It's a just very silly band uh, with Paul Rust and Michael Cassidy and Amin Zaruki. And uh, they uh, were from the TV show Love on Netflix a few years ago. And we have oh, a show coming it. up in Los Angeles on September 18th at the Permanent Records Roadhouse. Cool. Are you still yeah. doing podcasts? Yes. I, uh, I've been... Slowing down a bit. I haven't been doing my own show for a little while, but I am a part of the uh, Allison Rosen is your new best friend show, uh, and that's a biweekly podcast. Um, yeah, I'm the on-air producer of that show. So, cool. Well, yeah. you're very busy. Yeah, ish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, listeners, uh, I'll be back next week to talk about the rise of Skywalker minutes sixty-one through sixty-five. Um, I'm on most of the social media places. Links will be in the show notes and link will be in the show notes. Uh, if you want to join my discord server and talk more about all these episodes and, uh, music from, I don't know, all the star Wars stuff, all the shows and all the movies. Uh, with that, that, that's, that's all I have. May the force be with you and see you next week on star Wars music. Minute.